All right, I should be live. Hopefully, I am now. At any rate, good to see you all here, whoever's here. I don't have anything showing up in the comments yet, so I don't know if there's anybody here. There it is, we got six people already. Anyway, here we are on another Wednesday evening, and uh, got a few things to show you. Got my seeds sitting there. I'm going to make a video about those probably tomorrow. A little follow up to the uh, canning video where I showed you how to save the seeds. I'll show how to know if when they're ready to uh, when they're ready to be put up for storage. I'll give you a quick little demonstration here. The seeds have a little bit of a membrane on them. If you take a couple and you rub them in your hands, I don't know if you can see that. A little tiny papery membrane will flake right off. And that's how you tell that they're dry enough for storage. But anyway, like I said, I'll make a little short video about that tomorrow and explain it. And there's something else I need to uh, tell everybody that I didn't know at the time when I made the canning video. Apparently, the USDA no longer approves canning zucchini and other breeds of summer squash. But, set this down. But it's still okay to can got one of those little papery things in my nose but it's still okay to can winter squash like uh, acorn squash buttercup butternut hubbard uh, kombucha a few others that don't come right to mind and pumpkin those are still okay to can so uh, and apparently the reason for it is not so much that it's you know suddenly discovered that it's dangerous to can those things it's just that they've never completely tested the uh, tested the processes on them you'll probably still be okay if you chunk them up and can them that way but it's not it's no longer considered an approved procedure so you shouldn't really do that but anyway didn't uh i didn't get to very many secondhand stores this week but i did stop off at a couple of antique sh shops that i usually do and i found some things that are really cool some things that I've been looking for for a long time. First one I'll show you is uh, this here. That's an unmarked. That's a uh, either a gem pan. Sometimes they call them bread pans. Those that bread pan, bread stick pan that I have. They also make a version with eleven sticks, and they're subdivided like this with a divider down the middle and make little shorter bread sticks. But this is more of a gem pan. And gems were little little small cakes. They could be bread. I'm going to make some bread in this once I get it done. And I ran that through my lye bath, got it all cleaned up. There's a, you see there's a couple little marks in the middle there. Look like a rivet head, probably something on the pattern. There's no marks, no maker marks on it. I thought I saw a number seven on one of the handles, but it turns out it wasn't actually there. And you see there's a gate mark there, and then there's one down here. So that's pretty old, and uh, it's a nice pan. And I got that for 20 bucks. So that was a hell of a nice deal. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes it does pay to stop off and have a look at antique shops for what they have. And uh, like I said, something like this would be great for making dinner rolls, things like that, making uh, gems, little cupcake type things and uh, I'm going to put this in a vinegar bath rather than running it through my electrolysis tank for, well actually no I wasn't going to do this as my monk pan I'll get back to that anyway I'm going to clean this up a little bit more like I said I just got that out of the lye bath needs a little bit more cleaning then I can see, season it up and have, have at it with that uh, let's see here that guy. Then that little Volrath pan that I showed you last week. That yeah, that actually is marked. When I got it, I couldn't see the markings on it. All I could see was number three. And I didn't notice it until I showed you on air and the light hit it just right that it was actually a marked Volrath, which is pretty cool. It's kind of fine lines, so yeah, I could see where I wouldn't necessarily see that. That's all cleaned up. That's ready to get seasoned. Once I get a few other things ready to go, I can do a whole batch of things at once. Set him aside. 
and I need this. And then that monk pan, ran that through the live bath, got that stripped off. It's pretty good on this side, but the back you can see there's a bit of rust on there. And this I was going to, uh, instead of doing it with electrolysis, I was going to do with a uh, smoke in a vinegar bath for a bit, just enough to take that rust off. The deal is with electrolysis, you get kind of a shadow effect. The electricity will come, will take the path of least resistance, and it'll leave the uh, it'll leave the object at the points that are closest to the to the uh, other electrode. And sometimes what you get is sort of a shadow effect. See, I ran this through electrolysis, and the back side comes really nice and clean, but the other side doesn't. What happens is, see all them little points? That's where the current will flow into the solution and it'll leave kind of a shadow behind where the uh, electricity, rather than going out through that surface, you know, travels up that point and takes a, you know, path of least resistance. And this here I'll probably soak in vinegar too because, you know, when you put it in vinegar, the vinegar gets everywhere. And uh, I like the... Uh, results you get from electrolysis better than you do get from vinegar you know it's not really a huge difference but i do like electrolysis better but for some things like this corn stick pans waffle irons things like that things that have a real complex shape to them a lot of times you, you'll be better off soaking them in a vinegar bath to get rust off of them than you would to uh than you would using uh electrolysis Anyway, let's see who all is here. Danica Mia Bullock, hello from Chile. Oh, hello from Wisconsin. It's good to see you, Stuart. Uh, Kevin Carl rocks. All right, let's get on with it. We are on with it. Hey, Billy Lee. Angie's here. It's good to see you guys. Anyway, so, so yeah, I'll get that cleaned up. Hopefully this weekend. Got my wood pretty much done. I had uh, my nephew and one of his friends over yesterday. We got everything all loaded onto the hay wagon. But I still have a little bit of, uh, I got to put just a little bit more on there. And I got some odds and ends and pieces I wanted to get cleaned up before winter. So I'll have plenty of wood put up. And it'll only take me half a day or so to get that cleaned up. I also found, when I was out shopping, this Wardway. Now, Wardway was a brand made for Montgomery Ward by Wagnerware. And uh, I didn't have one of these, so I'm happy to have found that. The guy at the shop wanted $32 for it, but it's a bit of a spinner. I mean, I don't know if you can quite see it at that angle. Looking at the bottom, you can see it there. It's got a little bit of a depression in the bottom, so it's bowed downwards on the bottom of the pan. If you put it on a flat, on a flat surface, it'll spin a little bit. And since it's a spinner like that, I'm talking about 25 bucks for it, which is a nice price for a nice little pan. And uh, a lot of times, if you're somewhere where you can haggle over the price, like a flea market or an antique shop, if a pan has a little bit of wobble to it or it'll spin, a lot of times you can talk them down a bit on the price, which is always kind of nice. And it doesn't affect the way it cooks. You know, at worst, you'll need a little bit more oil in the bottom of the pan to make sure everything's covered on the bottom. You know, it's unless it's warped so bad that it looks like the bottom of a salad bowl, it really doesn't make a difference for uh, performance unless you have a glass top stove, and then it might be a little bit tough, but on a gas stove or an electric stove with coils, a little bit of spin, a little bit of wobble isn't really a problem. Uh, what else here? whistling bad for some reason. Cleaned up that gate mark griddle that I was going to have for my next giveaway. That's just about ready to, uh, needs one more little scrubbing and then I'll be ready for seasoning. Still can't quite make out what the letters are. It looks like BLS. You know, but they're a little bit blobby. But I think it's pretty sure that's BLS. But it might even be a C. It might be a BCS. If anybody's heard of that, you might be able to figure out who made it or not. You know, it's hard to say, but that's really nice 
the surface is real nice. Like I said, you can see a little bit of the casting flaws, those little kind of waves and pits in there. It's been machined smooth, but that's a, a side effect of using the gate marked, you know, the bottom gated process for making the pans because the air is trying to get out the same opening that the iron is trying to get in. It tends to cool the edge of the iron as the uh, mold fills. So that uh, rather than being entirely liquid, you got kind of a, it's not solid, but it's uh, you know, a lot more viscous and it doesn't really flow together good sometimes. Sometimes they flow perfectly, but usually, you know, gate mark pans, you'll see flaws like that on, you know, both sides of the uh, pan. But yeah, like I said, that's when I finally get to 40 channel members, that's one of the things I'm going to give away. The other is a nice uh, three-legged cauldron, which I don't have right at hand. You can, yeah, you can just kind of see the shape of it sitting over there. That's it for them. The other two things that I found when I was out, well, three things actually, are a couple of tools that I've been looking for for quite a while. One of the things is I've been trying to find a six pound sledgehammer. A lot harder to find a six pound sledgehammer than you might think. You can order them and they're about 40, 45 bucks a piece, but most places have either eight or 10 pound sledges. And I do quite a bit of demolition work smashing down block walls and things like that. And I've always preferred a six pound hammer because you can swing it faster. And if you're reaching overhead or reaching off to one side, trying to break up blocks with it, it's a lot easier to handle. And like I said, you can swing it a lot faster and actually hit harder on most things with six pound hammer than you can a heavier one. But they're kind of tough to find. Nobody really carries them. Like I said, you can order them. And I actually lucked out and found two at the same spot. Paid two bucks a piece for them. One's just a head. Oh, they're both just a head, but one's just a regular six pound sledgehammer head. And the other one is really cool. That's a six pound, that's actually called a cross peen hammer. It has that, that's a peen on the end, is what that's known as. I got a handle for it. I just got to take time, clean the inside of the eye out a bit and then get that all put together. The other thing I got is uh, something I've been wanting for years. There's a bunch of times when it would have been really handy to have, but finally found one and I just had to buy it because like I said, I've wanted one for years and main reason is because I just look so damn good holding it. That is a broad axe. Now, a broad axe is made for hewing round logs into square beams. They're uh, beveled only on one side of the head, and one side of it is flat. And the other side isn't. You, know, you can kind of see the profile there. And the blade is also curved a little bit so that the edge is, so as you try to chop a nice straight flat surface with it, it keeps the body of the hammer, uh, hammer, keeps the body of the axe away from the edge so that you can make a nice straight parallel line. This isn't the right handle for it though. This is just a common double, single bit axe handle because a real broad axe handle also has a bit of an offset to it. So that, uh, again, so that you can keep most of the handle and the head away from the edge that you're trying to shape. Like I said, it's only, there you can see it's just beveled on one side. It's in real nice shape. Paid 70 bucks for it. And, believe it or not, the maker's name on that, you probably won't be able to see it, it's pretty small. But it's made by I Blood from Boston, New York. And it says it's English cast steel. And it's a pretty cool axe. Did a little bit of looking into a... Uh, I blood company. Apparently they were pretty big business back in the 1800s. They made axes and size in Boston, New York. And uh, they were kind of in a, on the outskirts of town and Isaiah Blood owned tons and tons of land out there plus his factories. And uh, eventually called the area Bloodville for a long time. And uh, Isaiah himself 
went on to become a New York State Senator. He also made this thing they called them Blood's Battle Axes for the Civil War, and they looked like a like a bolo style machete, basically. But uh, yeah, he was big in the axe and sigh making business for quite a while. Eventually his uh, plants burned down in around 1900, and by then they had merged with the American Axe and Tool Company. And they still kept the blood brand name going for quite a while after Isaiah died in, I think it was 1870. And his uh, son, a fellow named Knickerbacker, ended up with the company. And they kept his, uh, you know, because he was quite famous by then already, and they kept the uh, blood name going. Anyway, I'm going to, you can buy, you know, they're not real common, but you can get, you know, properly offset broad axe handles. And a lot of people, you know, doing a little bit of looking around at some of the axes on eBay and things like that, they'll say they're either a right or left hewing because it's set up so that, you know, you can either go down the right or left hand side of something. But actually the head itself doesn't really matter because you can simply, you can see it's the same either direction. You can just uh, take the head off and flip it around. It's actually the handle that has the uh, right or left offset that you can't change. But anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. It's a hefty little thing. I ain't sure exactly what it weighs, but that's probably got to be a good seven or eight pounds. Yeah, hmm. got the itch for some reason. I hate that. Anyway, yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool find. And for a little more you know, necessary thing for work. I was tickled to find a six pound ball head finally. So I'll have to uh, do a little bit of whittling for that to get the uh, a good handle all fitted on that. But I got that at another antique shop that I uh, do quite a bit, but you know, known for quite a while. It was the same uh, same shop where I got that great big favorite, favorite uh, roasting pan. Yeah, I do look good with it. Yeah, that's uh, it's one of the good, one of the main reasons why I bought it because you know it just looks a damn good hold of it. Uh, morning light, uh, morning lights, good to see you, bookworm, fluffy otter, uh, Dan Farge really likes my channel. Thank you, Dan. I do my best to try and be halfway useful anyway about this sort of thing. I need to go back and watch me cleaning up old pans. No, you yeah, have some now. Uh, what do you have, morning light, for pans, just out of curiosity? Uh, Doomver, the northern aggressor. Nice, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mentioned Angie and you know, told you about it. But yeah, it's, it's a big axe. That's got to be well, probably about a foot. On the cutting edge, you know, good 11 inches anyway. So, you can definitely do some hacking and whacking with that. And like I said, there's quite a few times over the years where shaping logs, it would have been handy to have something like that. Not looking for a, for a flea market. The Amish folk are out here still use this type of tools. Yeah, you know, there's quite a few hand that and, uh, and ads is fairly handy it looks kind of like a hole only it's meant for cutting wood it's the same sort of thing where you can uh you know flatten off the top of a beam well that would be pretty handy too for various things i'm doing for yeah the handles i'm looking for in colonial williamsburg yeah and i have uh there's a couple of amish amish makers that sell online that have that that make handles for that I could make one for myself, but I'd probably never get around to it, so. But yeah, they're out there. I mean, you can buy new ones, so I'll save myself the time and effort. We don't have any hickory trees around here. We're a little bit too far north for hickory, but we do have uh, blue beech. They're not actually in the beech family. I think they're also called American hornbeam or muscle wood, and they make real good handles. It's very strong wood, very dense. And uh, you know, it's mostly kind of a shrubby, bushy kind of thing around these parts anyway. 
and uh, some people plant it for decorative plants to call it muscle wood because the the trunks you know they only get maybe six inches around the biggest but the trunks look like a uh, you know like it's you know muscly sinewy kind of look to it real cool looking trees but like I say I mean they get to be around here they're kind of a clumpy bushy sort of thing and they get about well maybe eight ten feet tall and you know they're real slow growing so it takes a long time to get a size to them uh, cast iron a couple of different brands well which brands morning light just out of curiosity for what you have uh, let's see what else where was I oh I finally got around to making my blackberry jelly I was doing busy doing that beforehand that nice color you kind of see it there this is still a bit warm because I just pulled them out about a half hour ago but it's already got a pretty good soft I'll try and show you there it's gelling pretty good it's got a nice soft set to it you know it's got to sit a while longer and like I said it's still warm so that was really nice that turned out good there's a bit of leftover that I had and uh, some of the foam I skimmed off I always save save the foam off of it oh yeah it's gelling up real good and yeah, it tastes real nice. It's got a real good blackberry flavor to it. I didn't film it because there's a lot of other jelly making videos out there. And I didn't feel like monkeying around setting up the camera. But yeah, it tastes really good. Jelly is a pretty easy one to make and can. But you have to follow the instructions precisely. Otherwise, you'll have trouble with it gelling up. And sometimes even if you do do it right, for some reason it just doesn't set. But even trying to make a double batch at the same time, a lot of times for some reason it just will not work. It won't gel. Where uh, if you made just two single batches, it would have worked fine. On the lookout for number eight or nine waffle iron. Yeah, there's you know, they're, they're, they're out there. You know, most of the Griswold ones that I've seen selling at auction are going for, you know, depending exactly how old they are you know which logo they have i see them going for around 80 to 125 you know some of the really old and rare ones you know getting up close to 200 but that's usually for like <clears throat> the uh the first few years they made them but there's one that has a patent date of 1882 i think and it says griswold manufacturing company on it and uh those are pretty scarce and they're pretty expensive but you can find uh Wagner Ware. Uh, Crescent was another fairly well-known name. Um, but yeah, usually 75 to 100 if it has the base with it, especially. And, uh, you know, the bases can be kind of hard to find. But even if you find one that's just the uh, the iron itself, the two paddles, you can still use that on a gas stove or on an electric stove, just laying it right on the burners, even without a base. So, so uh you know, if you come across one for a decent price, yeah, go ahead and get it, even if it doesn't have a base, because it'll still be usable as a waffle iron. <clears throat> and a lot of times you can't find them, you know, pretty reasonable. I've gotten, you know, paid anywhere from, you know, 25 to 60 bucks for uh, most of the waffle irons that I have. Uh, speaking of pans, going thrifting on Friday, hope to find some. Well, I hope you do too. It's always nice to go out and find stuff. You know, I mean, that's half the fun of collecting anything. I mean, if you're, you know, anything from baseball cards, coins, cast iron, anything like that. You know, I mean, half the fun of the thing is going out and hunting around for it. It's always fun to find something, even if it wasn't something you were exactly looking for. They're always kind of neat to see what's out there, if nothing else. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that uh, with that jelly. And like I said, it looks like it's going to set up real good. It's already already good and gelled. Uh, pulled out to make mostly lodge, but they're good pans. Yeah, lodge is you know pretty good pans. Even you know even the newer ones, you know a lot of people don't like because they have that pebbly kind of rough texture to them. But uh, you know they work perfectly good, and they're a great 
you know, a great pan for somebody who's just starting off with cast iron, you know, doesn't know if they, if they're going to like it because they're inexpensive. You can get a brand new, you know, a 10 inch number eight sized skillet for, they usually sell around 25 bucks. And that's the most common side, most common size that people have. And, you know, it's a little bit different cooking. There's a learning curve to it, you know, learning how, uh, cast iron cooks as opposed to you know stainless steel or aluminum but you can get the hang of it pretty fast and how to take care of it and it's not hard to take care of it so uh you know once people get used to using them they can go ahead and branch out from there or just stick with it i mean there's no reason why you, you don't have to go ahead and start looking for vintage cast iron if you're just looking for something to cook with you know just use the lodge that you have it's not a lot of money you know, you're not spending a whole bunch of money to try something that finds out that you just don't like it, you know, don't like the way it cooks or something like that. And some people don't. It's just, uh, just realized I got my mic way over here. It'd probably be a little easier to hear me if I get it within, you know, four feet of myself. But yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, I recommend Lodge for starting off or for keeping it, you know, or just staying with it. Cast iron is the only way to bake cornbread. Yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, cast iron really works great in the oven for pretty much anything, I mean, a lot of different things. Because it, uh, it'll act as kind of a buffer as your burner kicks in and out or your heating element in the electric oven. It absorbs a lot of the heat and keeps things from, you know, from heating up too fast and scorching or burning. And when the element is off, it'll slowly release that heat and it'll, you know, even things out so it cooks a lot better. And it browns things up real nice, like like I said, cornbread. I mean, that's just the way to uh, do it. So uh, more fun to, uh, oh, North Shore Preparedness. Glad to see ya. Let's see, I must have missed a couple here. Yeah, I'll stop by. Back is in great, well, that's not good bad backs of pain there's been plenty of times i've been crippled up from back being sore some are more fun to kick out cook on vintage cast iron but i have a lot of modern lots too yeah and uh you know i mean every pan is a little bit different you know everyone even the same brand same age everyone cooks a little bit different and as you uh you know as you use the pans you have you'll find out which ones work best on the stove top, which ones work best in the oven. And, uh, you know, some pans seem to brown better than other ones. You know, it's just the, uh, just the way they are. I mean, everyone is a little bit different. Been for months. Let's see. Fluffy Otter. Enjoy your Wagner like your lodge too, but it's getting increasingly heavy. Yeah, a lot, you know, the newer lodge pans are, uh, yeah, they're pretty hefty for their size. You know, and, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people really like the vintage pans because they can be half as heavy as, uh, the same size newer pans. There are, uh, people making cast iron skillets now, but they're, uh, fairly expensive. But they are, they're real nice and light. They're all machine smooth. You know, and there's different brands, Finex, uh, Butterpat, about a half a dozen of them, and I draw on a blank on most of them, Stargazer. And, uh, you know, they're all real good pans, but most of them are pretty expensive new. I mean, they're anywhere from 150 to 300 bucks a piece, depending on uh, what size or what maker. But then again, that's you know, cast iron skill for the last centuries, really. You know, I've got a lot of them that are, you know, 125 years old and still using them. So it's, you know, it's not something you're going to have to replace anytime soon. So yeah, 300 bucks, is quite a bit of money to spend right up front, but you average it out as a per year thing. It's pretty hell of a good deal, really. Uh, picked up a new Lodge Black Lock for five bucks. Yeah, the uh, they've been making them for a year, maybe two years now. Their Black Lock line, they're uh, 
quite a bit lighter. They're not as light as the original, the really old lodge that they're making. You know, because uh, Blacklock was the original lodge company. It was Blacklock Foundry, owned by a guy named Lodge. And uh, they didn't mark any of their pans, except for there's a few lids that are marked. And I think a couple of Dutch ovens that have the black lock name on them, but none of the skillets were marked. And you can't really tell a black lock pan from a old lodge pan because the, uh, the black lock foundry burnt down, I think 1910 and, uh, they rebuilt it and just renamed everything lodge after Mr. Lodge who owned the thing. And they use the same patterns that they had from before from the uh, Blacklock Foundry. So there's really no way of telling exactly which one is a 1915 Lodge and which is a 1905 Blacklock. But at any rate, you know, their real light pans are a lot lighter than uh, anything else out there that uh, Lodge made. And Lodge got heavier over the years. And, uh, you know, it's really a matter of preference if you like a thicker, heavier pan or a lighter, thinner one. You know, the heavier ones work a little bit better in the oven and the thinner ones work a little bit better on the stove top. But you can use either one for either purpose. And, uh, you know, some manufacturers, that was their big selling point. It's a you know, big, heavy, massive pan. And like, uh, uh, I think it was Martin Stove and Range. You know, they were known for making heavier weight pans than most other folks were making at the time you know and lodge has always been uh lodge and bsr were always a good bit heavier than the uh uh wagner's and griswold's that are being made at the same time uh, fluffy fluffy outer lodge has some new yeah they all yeah lodge has some cast iron the body is cast iron has a steel handle you know lodge's got quite a few different things going on right now you know they've always been making a few different different lines let's see here nice flat iron for steaks yeah i mean they're it's hard to beat uh cast iron for frying steaks what i want to get is a uh is a broiler pan and not not the broiler pans that you see it's basically a skillet that has you know uh bars across the bottom of it you know it's a solid pan but they used to make broiler pans that were basically kind of a uh like a grill they had you know slots and openings in them some were kind of a lattice work design and they were meant for use on a uh on a wood cook stove you take the eye out and then you set that broiler pan over it and uh you use it for grilling steaks and things like that. You know, it was basically a you know small grill that you could use on your uh, wood cook stove. And I, hopefully I'll be able to get one of them before too long. I've seen a couple. I saw one that was made by Home Comfort, which was a big stove maker. You know, I was just kind of looking around on eBay, but the guy wants like 200 bucks for it, which is a hell of a lot more to be willing to pay for anything. But it's pretty nice. And it'd be kind of cool to have a, you know, stove manufacturer branded uh, broiler pan for that. Uh, Wagner made some in around 1920 or so. They had a wood handle on them and it was around, like I say, it was just a round skillet. It had kind of two levels of bars with a slit between them. And uh, like I said, you know, hopefully I'll be able to find one at a reasonable enough price that you know, a cheap guy like me would actually buy it. And, uh, you know, seeing as we're coming up on winter, I will be definitely using the uh, cook stove here pretty soon. I got a sweeper all out, get it cleaned up and tuned up for the winter. And, uh, you know, I got my wood all cut. And it's going to start turning cold tonight. I got a hibiscus bush I got to bring in off the porch and uh, another plant because it's going to gonna be a hard freeze the next few nights anyway. It's been kind of unusually warm for the last few weeks. And uh, we didn't really get a frost until last week, which is really late because uh, normally you start getting frost middle of September or so. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's 
mid-October and we've only had one kind of light frost so far here. But that's going to change tonight. So once I get done here, I got to bring in my plants, let them drip, bring them up on the porch a little bit, let them drip out some because it was raining and thunderstorming this afternoon. And, uh, you know, luckily it stopped because pretty much every time lightning starts striking around here, something tips over and interrupts the power. Uh, no frost here yet in Ontario. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been late. You know, a lot of frost has been uh, kind of put off. But that's okay. You know, it's been pretty decent weather for the last couple of weeks, so I wasn't fighting snow and freezing my ass off cutting wood, which I have done before. And you never have quite enough wood. There's been quite a few times you end up a couple, three weeks short, and you're out there wading around in the snow scrounging up wood and cutting and splitting when you really don't want to be doing that yet. Uh, where am I? I'm in northern Wisconsin. <laughs> be over in a bit. I'll well, see you when you get here. Uh, North Shore, you're leaving? Okay. Or is Billy leaving? Uh, and you said she'd be right back. All right, North Shore is leaving. Well, it's nice to see you, North Shore. Feel free to drop in any any time. Uh, it's supposed to turn in a couple of days, though. 10 degrees lower, 10 Fahrenheit lower daytime times. Yeah, I mean, it was almost 70 yesterday. You know, working outside, it was about 71, 72. And, uh, you know, that's unusually warm for this time of year. Usually it's, you know, kind of mid-50s or so, maybe up to 60 if it's nice out. But, you know, it's that time of year things start turning but like i say that's nice because now i can use my cook stove again without chasing myself out of the house with the heat all right you know it isn't you know too bad it's, you know like i said it was a rainy day so i was in the house monkeying around with my jelly and other things but uh i still got a few things to do get everything all winterized and caught up and prepared for winter but not too much i'm in pretty good shape so i got the biggest like i said i got the wood pretty much done got all the biggest stuff done that needs to be taken care of before winter there's just a couple other little mickey mouse projects that i wanted to get done so let's see here was i to do, do. I think I covered pretty much everything I wanted to mention. Uh, did the jelly, did that, did that. Yeah, and yeah, like I said, uh, yeah, mid to low 30s by Sunday. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit colder than, the, colder than that around here. They're, you know, talking a hard freeze, which is down into, down into the 20s, so it'll be nice. Uh, found a senior aluminum crusty corn cobs pan, 10 bucks. Yeah, that's a good price. Yeah, they made those in aluminum too. And I've seen some that I'm pretty sure were shop projects. You know, somebody used a uh, corn stick pan for a pattern and, uh, you know, cast an aluminum one. You know, they're pretty rough, but you can see there's kind of, you know, it says Wagner wear on them and it's that style. But they're aluminum, you know, like I said, it, it looks pretty much like a shop project, but Wagner themselves actually did make some, you know, they made a lot of aluminum stuff. I mean, they made aluminum stuff pretty much from the start of the company back in the 1890s. And uh, most of the things that they have, there's an aluminum version of it, especially the, uh, you know, the bakeware. Uh, Kevin Carl, well, it's good to, that you got to see this part of it anyway and watch the rest of it when it's done. Yeah, and 10 bucks is a pretty good price for them. You know, usually uh, the cast iron Wagner ones go for, you know, around 25 or so. Kind of, you know, depends on where you are, what, uh, which size it is. The senior ones, you know, they usually go for around 40 or so, so... 
you know, an aluminum senior sized one for 10 bucks is a real good price. All right, and stay well and safe, North Shore. We'll see you next time around. Uh, yeah, what else? I, I, you know, one of these days, I'm actually going to start taking notes during the week when I'm thinking of things that I'm going to talk about because I always forget about half of them. You know, I could probably do a four hour show sometimes if I actually discussed everything that I had thought of. But it's a little more fun just kind of making it up as you go along too sometimes so but yeah you know maybe someday i can actually you know, put some real effort in to try and make a professional looking <laughs> professional looking show that's actually worth watching let's see if it works like gem pans i have two of those yeah gem pans are cool you know like i said that uh you know well, it's kind of buried now on the bottom of the pile but yeah, that's actually a gem pan. There's a lot of different different styles. There's round ones, flat ones. Uh, some of them are more, they call them plat pans. They're like, a, you know, silver dollar pancake type pans. And most of the gems were, uh, you know, they're rectangular, but they have kind of a rounded bottom to the bottom of, to the, uh, bottom of the cup. And there's a couple of real uh, oddball ones that uh, Griswold made. They weren't marked Griswold. But they're real rare and they have the little cups kind of outlined laid out in sort of an h pattern you know there's a row of cups down this side and then a row between them or a couple rows between them and they have a real distinctive pattern to handle and those are real rare and uh you know there's a couple of real old makers you know they've been making that style pans for since the mid 1800s anyway so uh you can find a lot of, you know, some of them are pretty expensive. You can find some that aren't very, like, really expensive. But, you know, there are some pretty pretty cool and pretty rare ones out there. It'd be nice to uh, come across some of them. But, you know, even if you do, it'd probably be more than I want to spend on them. Like I said, you know, 200 bucks for that. Mike wants to know what the best find I ever came across was. Uh, well, that monk pan. You know, that was a hell of a deal. I haven't been able to find any uh, any prices on them, you know, because they're pretty scarce and they don't sell all that often. You know, but uh, for the other ones that are similar to it, that Griswold made, the uh, Western Trading Company and the uh, Andresen pans, the, uh, the prices have pretty much doubled over what they were listed in the book. You know, and the... Uh, that's fairly close to the top of the pile. Yeah, in the number 33 like that one, I haven't been able to find much for prices on it, but they, uh, like I said, they were listed in the book anywhere from 250 to 350 You know, that was in, in uh, 2005. You know, I don't think they really have, might have probably haven't doubled in price like this, you know, five to seven hundred. But I wouldn't be surprised if something like this is going for, you know, 350, 400 it really wouldn't surprise me. So, uh, yeah, you know, for 35 bucks or something that's worth 10 times that much, it's a pretty good deal. But yeah, I mean, I find all kinds of little cool things that you're really surprising, you know, that big, uh, that great big favorite roaster. You know, I paid a little bit less than what full price for something like that would have been. But, uh, you know, great big roasters like that are nearly impossible to find. And since she had it, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, just kind of lucked out in finding it. Uh, what do I cook in that? Uh, I did a video on this. They're uh, also called apple skeevers. They're a Danish pancake ball. You fill the cups mostly full of pancake batter or some other type of batter and you let the bottom cook then you kind of snag the edge of the cup and you pull it up a little bit and you let as you roll it up the uh uncooked batter will pour out into the bottom and then, then that'll cook and you just kind of keep rolling it and dumping it and eventually you end up with a ball and uh and uh, and uh 
you end up with that ball and usually there's a hollow spot inside meaning you fill that with jelly or some other kind of filling or you can dip them in you know syrup and butter and things like that and they're really good and like i said i did a couple of videos using a apple skeever pan and uh you know one i did the basic pancake ones the other one i did scrambled eggs with a little sausage ball in the center fried up some little sausage balls and you fill the you know fill these with beaten up eggs drop your little ball in there and you do the same thing you just keep rolling it and letting the uncooked stuff cook and keep rolling it around and you end up with these scrambled egg balls with a sausage center and they're really good but what makes this one kind of different is that's a monk pan by griswold in number 33 they made these uh apple skeevers are danish pancake balls but they call them monks in sweden and norway and uh griswold did some con did contract work for a guy named alfred anderson in minneapolis he's also the guy who made that and that's also made by griswold but he was just the uh you know the dealer and the guy who owned the patents and that's the uh heart-shaped heart-shaped waffle iron and he made uh Krumkaka irons, which is kind of a wafer. But anyway, uh, most of these were either marked Anderson or Western Trading Company, which is what Anderson's company became after he left. And they're worth around 100 bucks a piece. But the ones that are just marked Monk Pans with the number 33 on it are pretty scarce and they're worth a lot more. Uh, I might message you on Friday if you find anything. Uh, you've been watching my videos but you're a noob yeah i mean there's a yeah you know i got my uh, guide to cast iron on you know seasoning restoring stripping and all that so if you ever get a chance or have any questions about things like that you can watch them and cover most of it pretty yeah they are pretty you know and that's kind of cool too i mean i'll get that finished up before too long like i said i'm gonna use vinegar on that to uh remove the rust uh I'm trying to remember i got extra handles around here when i got it, it uh it only had one handle for the two things but i have a couple extra handles that might fit and i can whittle something that's usable but it won't really be the original ones and the cool thing is these uh anderson waffle irons and uh wafer irons also fit on a uh, Griswold waffle iron base and I have an extra Griswold base around here so I have bases that'll work just fine for that and uh the original bases for those weren't marked Anderson they were just uh number 975 Griswold waffle bases and that's how they're marked some were marked Griswold some weren't you know it's kind of hard to tell whether or not it's the original base that actually came with that particular iron because you know they were interchangeable with all the griswold ones and uh griswold did that too sometimes there'd be uh the uh catalog number on the base would be sequential with the catalog numbers on the two halves of the waffle iron and sometimes it wouldn't right from the factory it's just whatever they had around more or less because they had a uh, a couple of different bases are basically identical they just had different catalog numbers on it so they would you know ship out whatever number they had that fit that particular set of waffle irons and over the years a lot of times too the original base would get broken and somebody would you know, replace it with another one that happened to fit Yeah, I hope you find something cool, Angie. You know, I mean, there's, like I say, I mean, you never know what you're going to find. You know, I usually, uh, when I go do my grocery shop and I'll swing by the, you know, the Goodwill and there's a couple other secondhand shops. So I'll hit them up, see what they got. You know, a lot of times you don't find anything, but every now and then, you know, there's some pretty cool stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of fun to find something, even if you don't 
you know, something you don't need. You know, I already got quite a bit of uh, unmarked wagon wear stuff, you know, so I don't generally buy it. But it's kind of fun to see something like that sitting in the shop just because, you know, somebody else will get it. And uh, it's nice to have. How long have I, been, have I been collecting? I mean, really collecting, collecting, you know, probably about five or six years. But we've always had cast iron cookware, you know, my wife and I. She had a bunch, and I had some that I picked up over the years. So, you know, I've been using cast iron pretty much my entire life. And we always had, you know, had cast iron around. And every once in a while, if I find something neat, you know, I would pick it up just because it was a different sort of pan or something of that sort. So, you know, we're really, you know, looking into it and figuring out exactly what was what. You know, for six, you know, probably more like six or seven rather than five or six. A couple hours ago thrifting with your ma, she knows all the spots. Yeah. And uh you know even cast iron, like you can probably just see it over my shoulder there. Right there. Still got a little coffee in it. You know, Pyrex coffee pots. Whenever I come across one of them in a second hand store I usually buy it. I got uh several of them. You know, they're just pots and some because uh, the percolator stem on them is kind of fragile. And a lot of times they'll get broke. So if I can find one that has a stem in it, I'll buy it for spare parts because I have broke a couple over the years. But I sure to go through and thin out some of the extra ones because, you know, just having just the pot, you know, those those usually don't get broken very often. You know, I'm pretty careful with them. And uh, but I've accumulated a few too many extras but whenever I come across one that has the stem or the basket in it you know I'll pick it up because uh it's good to have spares and a lot of times I notice that they're uh they'll be mismatched they'll have the wrong stem and the wrong size pot because there's three different sizes of those uh Pyrex coffee pots and they all had different stems in them you know but there's you know all kinds of neat things floating around in the uh, secondhand stores. That's where I got my dehydrator. I got that at a, at a Goodwill and uh, got some extra craze for it. Uh, Billy Lee, night. Get yourself some sleep. Hopefully you'll sleep well. And uh, yeah, I mean, most of my stuff I pick up, you know, pick it up used, you know, in secondhand sh shops like that. And, uh, in secondhand shops and the fact you know a lot of the stuff that i built my house out of is recycled because like i said i do quite a bit of demolition work so uh my bathroom door that used to be in a school you know that's a big heavy door with a window in it nice frosted window and uh you know i just salvage that at work and all kinds of bits and pieces and odds and ends that uh that i can get secondhand or salvage at work bits of iron and whatnot for uh oh that that's what i was gonna mention i'll get to that in a second here you know and uh you know i'm kind of a scrounger anyway you know always looking for salvage and things like that so yeah milo's quite the lightning's got him a little rattled he used to be a lot more a lot more gun shy he's gotten used to loud noises and you know, I'm always shooting off bottle rockets for the hell of it, and that doesn't even bother him anymore. He used to just freak right out. But that doesn't bother him anymore, but he still gets all nervous and clingy when there's uh, thunderstorms around. And it was storming earlier, so he's curled up, you know, down over there. Got a little pillow there, an old pillow that he likes to lay on. So he's been, been quiet since the... Uh, afternoon pretty much uh yeah speaking of iron now that i got my wood all done i've got to do some uh welding on my snow plow adding on to that and doing a little bit of work on that so i'll finally have a good chance to uh to do the uh repairing cast iron videos that i want to do so you know once i got all my welder set up because i don't really have a shop in fact my Sometimes you can just see it. My welder is sitting on a cart right there. I usually keep it in the house, but now that I got my shipping container, I can finally get it out of the 
usually it's parked in the bathroom. You know, I can finally get my welder out of the bathroom. And uh, but once I have all that set up, I'll be able to do uh, at least a couple of videos on welding and brazing cast iron. So that'll be nice. Did I get some good lightning? A ah, fair bit. You know, it wasn't really a big storm. You know, it was a couple of, couple little cells rolled through. You know, it uh, you know, it was thunder and lightning for about a half hour, then it settled down for an hour, then another one came through. It's been kind of raining off and on, you know, thundering and raining and storming pretty much all day. You know, a little bit of light rain, but since noon it's been, you know, a brief passing thunderstorm about every hour, hour and a half. And it settled down about an hour or so ago, but it's still, uh, still raining. So I'll have to let my, my plants are out on the deck. I'll have to let them sit on the porch for a little while, let them drip through before I try and bring them in. They got to move some stuff around to the living room because that's where they live over the winter. The hibiscus is nice. I've had it for years, but uh doesn't do really good. Once it gets below 40 at night, it doesn't really even need to uh, be able to frost to do it. But it, uh, it'll stress it a bit once it starts getting below 40. And it's been pretty close the last few nights. Probably should have brought it in a bit earlier, but definitely has to come in tonight because it's going to be a hard freeze tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, getting some rain tomorrow and hopefully at least some lightning. Yeah, that's probably what we had here today, given where you are. You're pretty much due east of me. Yeah, thunder and lightning. Yeah, a nice storm is kind of fun. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'll uh, finally get some of that uh, some of that welding videos that I wanted to do. I don't think my camera can actually film actual welding, you know, because uh, it's pretty intense light, and I don't want to go frying my camera. You probably need a probably could if I had the right filters for it, and. Uh, yeah, I don't really have time to experiment around trying to set up a, you know, lens out of a welding hood for it and giving it a try. But, you know, I can show you the setup and the processes and that. I got some uh, nickel wire for my wire feed so I can hopefully, you know, show wire feed welding and stick welding and uh, doing some brazen with cast iron. And that'll be kind of nice. You can also silver solder it, but I don't have any of that handy. And it's basically the same process as brazing anyway, so, you know, just uh, gives a little bit different appearance, you know, because it's silver, more or less, instead of brass. But anyway, yeah, um, 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 um. Uh, where to get my cooking skills? Uh, just, you know, something I learned over the years. You know, I was helping around the kitchen when I was a kid. We did a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of gardening and canning, even when I was a kid, and, you know, learning how to can and prep stuff for that and uh, cooking. And, you know, it's pretty much something I've always done. So, uh, you know, didn't really pick them up any one place. And once you learn, you know, it, uh, it's like learning anything else. Once you learn some basic stuff, it really builds on itself from there to where you can, uh, you know, figure things out on your own if you want to try something that you can't find a recipe for. You got a pretty good idea of how it's going to turn out or how it's going to work and what's not going to go together. You can't just dump things together and hope for the best. And, uh, you know, a lot of things are, you know, following a recipe is, you know, pretty, pretty simple. You know, but some of the actual techniques, you know, you have to, uh, you have to learn, pick up on your own. Once you figure out the technique behind it, you know, following a recipe is a lot easier. So, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, like something that I've pretty much always done. So I can't really say where I picked up anything in particular, but just practice and just doing it, you know, go ahead and, you know, if you never cooked anything, go ahead and give it a try. I mean, baking bread, you know, a lot of people have trouble with it, but, uh, if you have a stand mixer, it's real easy. You know, because uh, you can just let the mixer knead it out for you. You know, and that's probably the biggest thing with baking bread is getting it kneaded right. If you're doing it by hand, it's easy to uh, it's easy to un easy to under knead it so that you don't get a decent texture on it. But with a uh, you know, if you got a decent stand mixer that you can knead bread with, 
you can, uh, you know, bacon bread's really easy. And uh, even if you have a, even if you uh, have like a bread machine, you can have the bread machine knead it and then take the dough and bake that in the oven. If you want to make rolls or hot dog buns or something like that, instead of the, you know, the bread machine lull, you can just use your bread machine to knead out your dough and then use that for something else. Uh, what do I know about GSW, General Steelworks Cookware? It was, uh, they're a big Canadian brand. You know, I don't know a whole lot about their history, but uh, I, th I think most of the Canadian cast iron makers kind of went out of business in the uh, 70s and 80s. Yeah, I don't really know if there's anything that's still still manufactured in Canada, but GSW was one of the, uh, you know, the big Canadian names. There was uh, GSW, uh, McClary, Smart. Uh, there's, there's a few others, but uh, yeah, McClary, Smart. Uh, one right on the tip of my tongue, and I can't think of it. But yeah, they were, uh, like I say, they were Canadian. I think they were based in Ontario. You know, most of them were. They're uh, either Ontario or Quebec is where most of the uh, most of the Canadian cast iron was made. But they have a kind of a shield symbol with GSW in the middle of it. You know, shield lo you know, shield shaped logo with GSW in the middle of it. I think they say, you know, the uh, city and province they were made too offhand. But yeah, you know, that's, that's really what I know about them offhand. You know, a lot of the companies, you know, they had, you know, merged with each other, got bought out. So I don't really know, you know, the background history of them. But uh, you don't see a lot of, you know, a lot of Canadian cast iron in America. There is some floating around, but... Uh, you know, not as much as you really think. It didn't really get exported to the U.S. And it's the same thing in Canada, I guess. There's not a whole lot of a whole lot of American cast iron in Canada. You know, there's some, but same sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Had to step out momentarily. Grown child with a sore throat. Yeah, you get that now and then. Five bucks is a good thing. They stopped making it because you were born. That could be. It might all be uh, Angie's fault. Uh, would you recommend cast iron in a microwave? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. It uh, it makes for a nice light show, sparkly, sparkly flashes, and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it's not really good for the microwave or for the pan or for what you're cooking. Fire department might get involved at some point, depending on how far you let it. Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, pretty, pretty lights, all kinds of sparkly, flashy stuff, Grampy. So, you know, go right ahead. And since you're moving out anyway, you know, you don't have to worry about the apartment. You're in burning down. So, as long as you got all your stuff all packed up and ready to move, you can chuck it out the window quick as the uh, fire department's on their way. Yeah, it is... And everybody likes a nice sparkly light show. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so uh, don't put cast iron in your in your microwave. And it's been a little bit over an hour, and we've still got 20 people watching. That's always a good sign that not everybody went ahead and left already. So I will be back next week. You know, hit the uh, like button on your way out because YouTube likes it when it does that. Subscribe if you uh, like what I do, or if you really like what I do, go ahead and become a channel member. And once we get to 40 channel members, I'm going to give away that little griddle that I showed you earlier, and that kettle over there that you can just barely see off in the dark. They're both nice old ones, late 1800s. They're genuine ancient antiques over a century or over a century old, and they could be yours when we have a drawing when I finally get to 40 channel members. Anyway, like I said, hope you all enjoyed the show, and we'll see you at the same time next week. And hopefully this time I'll actually take a minute to jot down some of my thoughts so I'm not just kind of wandering and stumbling around here. And uh, I should wrap it up, and I'll see you next week.